Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to special lecture. <coughs> Today, our invited professor is a Professor A. Hood Kamen. So now we are very honored to invite the president of Academia Seneca, Dr. Chiwei Wong, to give the opening remarks. Now let's welcome President Wong. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce today's uh, special lec uh, lecture given by Professor Uli Kainan. Uh, he's a long time friend and uh, I think more than 20 years. Uh, and the, the, the topic he's going to talk about is, is kind of interesting. So I, I, uh, I didn't expect that he, he knows Taiwan so much. Uh, somehow he's fallen in love with Taiwan and has been here um, uh, quite a few times and looking at uh, every aspect of the, uh, the country. So he is writing a book and I think today he's going to talk about uh, some content of, of uh, his book. And we'll see if that is true. If not, then you, you may challenge him. So, so Uri uh, is currently a then professor of chemistry at the uh, uh, Technion, uh, Israel Institute of Technology. Uh, he is also a president of the Israel Chemical Society and editor in chief of uh, Israel uh, Journal of Chemistry. Uh, he was a uh, the founding president of the International Forum of Bio-Inspired uh, Engineering, and also the founder of the Institute of Catalysis, Science and Technology at Technion. So he has been very actively involved uh, in science and technology, but he is also very active uh, in education. He is a chairman of the advisory council of high school uh, chemistry education in Israel uh, under the Ministry of Education. And he's very active in the international forum. Uh, as, uh, as far as I know, he, uh, I don't know if th this news can be announced, but the new, the new role you're going to play in Asia and uh, did, did you talk about that yourself? So, so he's going to assume a major role uh, uh, in Asia uh, in terms of uh, research and high, higher education uh, in, in, uh, in this area. So the subject uh, he wants to talk, uh, I'm sorry, just to give you some background of his education. He uh, <coughs> received his PhD from Weizmann Institute of Science. Uh, and then he went to University of Wisconsin uh, as a postdoc with uh, Barry Trust. And after that, he came back to uh, Wiseman as a faculty there. And then since 1987, he moved to uh, Technia. And, and now he's a, a, an M professor there in chemistry. So today he's going to uh, talk about mankind versus sunny future and so does Taiwan. So let's welcome Uri. Well, thank you very much, Chi Wei, for the invitation. And uh, I'm very happy uh, to be here. Uh, I even prepared some speech in Mandarin, but I don't want to embarrass myself. I'm studying Mandarin, <laughs> but not that the best level at the moment. Uh, the, what I'm going to do today is uh, to squeeze two stories into one hour, and it's going to be a challenge for me. Uh, so forgive me if I rush uh, through some of the slides, uh, and uh, hope we can discuss it later uh, in some questions. Uh, the, uh, story, the first story that I want to tell you today is related to uh, the future of mankind. And uh, this is something I wrote in Angevane Chemie like a couple of years ago. Uh, 
about relating to the all kind of prophecies about uh, what's going to happen, uh, we're going to have uh, a bad situation uh, in the future, etc., and, and the human race is in danger, and, and the <coughs> apocalyptic uh, prophecies, uh, which I think it's uh, not true and has no ground. Uh, and this is a basis for uh, something that I'm writing. But <coughs> uh, after coming here uh, last year uh, for the first time for, for more than two months in, in this uh, country, as uh, Chiwe said, I, I fell in love with this country. And uh, I'll try to tell you why. Uh, and that will be the second part of my, uh, of my talk. So first, let's go to the issue of what's going to happen on what are the expectations for the human race. Uh, and can we survive on this planet for many years to come? Uh, and, and some people uh, uh, question this uh, issue. Uh, this is how uh, Earth uh, looked like before we human beings came over. And after we came over, this is the same thing it looks like now. So there is some change, and the environment has changed, and there are consequences to that. Uh, the, it's not only, and this is, you see, where uh, the, most of the people uh, reside. Uh, you can still see the good news that some areas like uh, Sahara or uh, you know outback of, of Australia are still vacant. But you see uh, what the problem is coming from. Uh, and the first one probably is not the first one, but the first who wrote it uh, was uh, Thomas Malthus. By the end of the uh, 18th century, in 1798, he wrote about as a principle of population. And he was extremely uh, concerned about the future of humankind because he say the land is limited, the resources are limited. And uh, by the way, at that time, the population of uh, the entire world was smaller than the current population of Europe. Okay? And he predicted that if the population of the world will increase by 10%, we're all dead because there is not enough land, there is not enough uh, way to produce food. And he was, although he was uh, uh, a priest, he uh, proposed things like stop marrying, uh, he proposed uh, uh, prostitution, he proposed postponement of, ma of marriage, celibacy, birth control, a priest. Uh, and otherwise, we're going to face all these terrible consequences. Since the time of Malthus, the population of humankind did not grow by 10%. It grew by 1,000%. And we're still here, happy. We had already breakfast. And we are not feeling like uh, we're going to go extinct uh, tomorrow. Uh, this is a, a prophecy which, at the time of Malthus, uh, I could uh, understand it. But what I do not understand, how people can write the same thing in 1972, the limit of growth. It's basically the same thing what Malthus said, but decorated with nice statistics and nice graphics. But it's basically the same thing. You see, most of the things are going to go to, to fall down. Uh, and the population, as a result, will decimate by, in less than 100 years, we're going to be all dead. Uh, and, and more than that, uh, this is. Uh, 2008, these people wrote again this book and uh, explaining even better graphics and more elegant statistics what's going to happen. Uh, and the, re the reason is the following. You see the population growth, which looks like a big explosion. Uh, and this is, again, where the people reside. And this is a, a logarithmic scale. So you see that uh, Africa, for example, is the fastest growing population. The entire world is pretty much, pretty soon going to reach uh, 10 billion people. Uh, Europe is declining, by the way, uh, unless they have more immigrants from North America, North uh, Africa. Uh, Latin America is, is growing fast. Northern America is slowing down. You see uh, more or less what's, what's happening. So uh, <clears throat> just a few numbers. Uh, let's talk in terms of weight how much weight we humans put on Earth. Uh, we together, we weigh like 600 million tons. This is how much weight uh, we put. Uh, 
the domesticated animals, like cows and, and, and sheep and pigs and, and chicken, uh, another 300 million tons. And if you think, uh, I could ask you, but we don't have time for that, how much is left for the other animals? All elephants and whales and fishes and everything else is just 100 uh, million uh, tons. And this is going down. This is declining. So, uh, because these things are going up rapidly and is going down, and this is the situation. So this is very pessimistic, but what is going to save us all is the last figure on this slide. And this is, we have 9 million tons of human brain uh, on this planet, and this is going to save us. And this is the point I want uh, to make today. Uh, what are the problems or challenges? We, we have, uh, I group them in six challenges. Uh, energy, I mean, limited sources of energy, fossil energy, raw materials, food, uh, problems of, of supply, uh, water, both quantity and quality, and then pollution, etc. air pollution and health for the growing, uh, <coughs> or, or exp a, a, a growing, uh, life expectancy, of course, we have uh, this could, uh, in, uh, introduces health problem. Uh, so I put it in, in sort of pictures, 81% uh, of all uh, energy is fossil, and 6% uh, is uh, uranium minerals. But people think that this is the solution. Uranium minerals is also limited uh, quantity. So this is going to be finished one day, not like the fossils. Uh, it's not only that, if you look at the non-ECD demand and the OECD, you see that the demand of the non-ECD of the developing world is growing and it's now in fact much, much bigger than the developed uh, countries. So we have high demand. And uh, the, the issue of, of population uh, explosion is not only the population, the numbers of people, but their expectation to have high uh, uh, standards of life, like everybody would like a, a car or iPhone, or, or uh, and that was not before. Okay, uh, this situation is even worse than energy, raw materials, because this is less visible, but uh, it's not only that we are depleting Earth uh, from, from all the natural uh, raw materials, it's also that the raw materials are not uh, evenly distributed, so you see, 90% uh, of all rare metals come from China, uh, germanium is mainly from China, uh, niobium from Brazil, platinum from South Africa, and uh, the, the rate by which we exploit these resources is growing. Uh, food, frankly, uh, this is not, uh, uh, we don't have, humanity does not have a problem with food. In fact, we have overproduction. This planet produces more food and increasing, increasingly more food than is needed. The problem is political, how to reach uh, these poor people. Uh, water, uh, you know, of course, that 97% of all water around the world is salt water in the oceans. Uh, only 3% is fresh water, but 2.7 is ice frozen uh, in, 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 the, in the poles. So only 0.3% is fresh water for our use. And 80% uh, of world population is under threat of, over, uh, of water security, and I would say that every year about 5 million children die from out of problems of water, either lack of water or contaminated water. Uh, and this uh, you can see here of, of uh, water security. Uh, pollution, uh, air pollution, uh, of course, uh, uh, let me tell you, I, yeah, I'm, uh, of course, uh, uh, global warming is one of the results of air pollution of carbon dioxide, but let me tell you just one thing, that more people die from the pollution produced by cars than from car accidents. Okay, it's less visible. Uh, health, uh, of course, uh, aging population, uh, poses new challenges. And with this, uh, the point I want to make is that these uh, challenges seem formidable, they're very big. And uh, people are scared about this uh, because they realize that there's no way to solve this problem. But the point I want to make is that the following. 
it is difficult to solve this problem today on the basis of what we know today, on the basis of current technologies. But the rate of developing new technologies will give us new technologies in the near future that will allow us to solve this problem. We're going to have new problems, but we will be able to solve them. Let me show you one thing, uh, going back to the prophecy of Malthus. This is uh, Peter Bruegel, this is 1565. It's a little bit earlier than Thomas Malthus, the end of the 18th century, but the word was about the same, where almost everybody was busy producing food by agriculture. About 95 or more percent were busy producing food. Uh, the, uh, and the question is, uh, do we, uh, yeah, some of the, uh, some part of the world are still in, in, in this technology, but uh, in most part of the world, or most of the food in the world is produced in an industrial mode. And now I'll ask you uh, uh, one question. Uh, how many people today are employed on the average in agriculture uh, in, in develop, uh, developing or developed countries? And <clears throat> the answer is that uh, there are only 2%. And in fact, this number is exaggerated because 2% are involved in agriculture, but only 1% in producing food. Others are doing, uh, you know, landscaping, they do parks, they develop the landscaping in your homes, etc. So only 1% is busy producing food by agriculture, and you see why. Uh, more than that, the food that you eat, every piece of, wo of food that you eat traveled on the average 4,000 kilometers from the production site to your dining table. 4,000 kilometers, by average. And uh, you can see that uh, vegetable uh, export import was 71 billion in 2001, and now we are close to uh, 250 uh, billion. So you see the increase. Now, I, I'm asking you another question. What is crop number one in the United States? And uh, I'm sure that those of you who, who know the United States will, based on this uh, picture, will tell me that it's corn. Okay, and maybe soybeans and maybe wheat, but that's wrong. Uh, corn is number two. Number one is loan, is grass. Okay, this is number one a crop in the United States that takes more water and more land than anything else. So this is not exactly a description of a, of a starving world. Okay, we're not starving. And uh, you see, you see the, the numbers here. Uh, if you will look at the, at the parameters or indicators, all this over 60 years, it's not something uh, that happened uh, just in the last couple of years. Life expectancy, living standard, GDP of the world per capita, food production, accessibility to safe water, public health, etc., personal liberty and human dignity, I'll come back in detail into these uh, last two points. All these are going up steadily in the last 60 years since the end of World War II. What is going down? Illiteracy, war death, extreme poverty. All these are going down. And the reasons for my optimism are the following. And I'll try to make it very quickly uh, to, to leave time for the other, for the Taiwan stuff. Uh, no explosion of knowledge, unpredictability of science, evolution of network society, personal liberty, and human dignity. These are the five parameters of the five trends. All of them are in rapid exponential increase. Uh, this is the basis for my optimism. And let's talk first about explosion of knowledge. Uh, when I say human knowledge, I refer to everything. Literature, history, uh, science, uh, technology, photos, uh, YouTube videos, uh, good movies, stupid movies, everything. Uh, and this doubles every one and a half years. Uh, population doubles every 50 years. Uh, if you don't see it from the numbers, I'll try to explain to you. Uh, the, by the way, the, you know, everybody knows about Moore's law. 
that over the last uh, 60 years or so, the processing power of a chip is doubling every one and a half years. But Moore's law is just a single case. It's a specific, a special case of every, almost everything else doubles every sometimes even less than a year, like wireless bits per second or, or a digital a camera pixel per dollars, uh, only one year doubling, 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 and every and this is for many years now, and it goes on uh, in in a way that. Uh, provides us uh, some idea about the exponential growth of knowledge. If you don't believe me, just remember that uh, iPad uh, was not known before 2009, and it's not only iPad, it's the product category. Uh, iPhone, there was no product, product category of smartphone before 2007. It was a different world. Okay. And <clears throat> and uh, not even talking about the old stuff. Uh, sometime, uh, this is statistical uh, point, sometimes it's like stock market, so people talk about uh, revolution. What is a revolution? They see, they jump from here to here, and they stand on the roof and say, oh, this is a revolution. It's not a revolution, it's part of a very continuous strand, or a catastrophic fall, something here. This is in, in, in the, you know, uh, blind people watching a, or describing an elephant, or in this type of the world, we, you, you look at one st spot of the leopard, okay, and you see one spot. If, but if you see the big picture, you understand there's a trend. And this is logistic curves, that one product like iPhone, like this, this uh, uh, stupid things, uh, everybody is now buying it, or, or almost everybody has it. In few years, or maybe less, nobody is going to be interested in this anymore because there will be a better product. So this, uh, this is the log logistic curve because there will be another one, something that will come along. And if you see what happened with the recording of voice or recording of everything else, you understand uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, let's compare on the same scale or the same graph the knowledge uh, versus population growth. If we take the amount of knowledge that was available in the world at the time of Jesus Christ or the time of the Romans as one, uh, and we see how did it grow, it doubled at the time of Leonardo da Vinci about 1500. So it was two. And then at the time of the French Revolution, American Revolution, it doubled again, so it became four. And then it started doubling, 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 and you see that in two, 1990, it was already 1,000 compared to the time of the Romans. But if I keep going now, uh, knowing that it doubles every 18 months, you see that in 1999, it was already 4,000 uh, compared to the time of the Romans. And by comparison, the explosion, what's so-called, of the population is not that bad. Uh, you see it's already, sorry, not, not for, it's uh, 16,000. And then by 2005, not too long ago, it's already quarter of a million. And uh, two or three years ago, it was already uh, four million or four and a half. And remember that we are now two doubling times. We are now three years after, so it is now uh, this number times four. So it's 16 or, or 17 uh, million times uh, more, and it's going to grow faster. By comparison, you see that the uh, explosion uh, of population is flat as this table. In fact, it's, in my view, it's even negative. It's going down. Uh, okay, so to summarize this point, uh, the knowledge uh, doubles every one and a half years. The number of scientists uh, doubles every 15 years. And one interesting thing, if you take all the engineers and scientists that ever lived on Earth, including Archimedes or whoever, Leonardo da Vinci that I mentioned, just take all of them. <coughs> uh, almost 80 or 90% of them are alive and getting salary today, okay? Uh, and, and you can see the estimated numbers. 
Uh, so that's uh, one issue. The, the second issue, which is important, is the unpredictability of science. And here, uh, I, I'll go fast, uh, and there are many uh, uh, statements by important people like uh, uh, John Erickson, a surgeon extraordinary to Queen Victoria, say that we'll never be able to operate on the human chest or brain. No way. And this is not, you know, a no, no one. It, Lord Kelvin, okay, heavier than air flying machine are impossible, okay. And, and so on and so forth. I, I don't have time to read all this to you. I just want to bring you an article from 1920 from, Sci from Scientific American, a very scholar uh, article that explained why there's no way we can cross the ocean with uh, anything else other than balloon. And the reason is because it's, you know, a uh, uh, steam engine is very heavy and you need the water and everything. And you cannot put it on a plane and bring it up to the air. So there's no way to have an uh, airplane crossing the Atlantic or, or Pacific Ocean only by ballooning. And at that time, uh, there was a young person, uh, Frank Whittle, uh, already an undergraduate student. He wrote a patent on the jet engine, okay? Uh, so, uh, just one more thing, which is uh, very significant. Like Nobel laureate uh, Thompson say, the possibility of travel in space seem to be at present to appeal to schoolboys more than to scientists. And, and uh, space travel is utter bilge. Now look at the date. We talk about 1956, 1956. One year later, Sputnik was already up in the outer space, and a few years later, Yuri Gagarin was out there. Uh, I brought this uh, prediction uh, just to uh, let you know that, that it's essentially impossible to predict the future, not what's going to be in 10 years, but what's going to be in five years, or even less than that. Here's another example of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, one of the best presidents ever uh, um, served on the United States. And he wanted to predict the future. So he did something which many politicians say today, this is the way to go, to put together a group of very clever people, scientists, engineers, etc., and ask them to get together and this tell what's going to happen in the next 20, 30 years. So there was a group of maybe uh, 300 scientists and, and engineers, and they gave, came up with very important uh, recommendation, agriculture research. That's where to go. And also uh, convert uh, um, coal into liquid uh, uh, fuel. That's where to go. They didn't know, by the way, that the German had already m solved this problem by the fischer tropsch uh, but the, the, the connection, uh, we, they didn't have sight finder at that time, all right. But this, this are the, the what what they recommended. What they missed, they missed the nuclear energy. Okay. Remember, by the way, that Rutherford made the statement in 1935 that there's no way to use the nuclear energy for anything. 1935. I think Project Manhattan Project was already uh, starting. Uh, <coughs> radar. Laser, all missed by the committee. Transistor, integrated circuits, NMR imaging, tomography, uh, everything here about computers. Uh, laser disc, compact disc, uh, all the rocketry and jet aircraft. It was beyond their expectation. Fax machine, uh, synchrotron radiation, all polymers. Everything about polymers, uh, natural uh, uh, liquid, <coughs> I mean synthetic gas. This is. Uh, uh, dye, uh, methyl ether, which is becoming now a very important diesel fuel. Antibiotics, uh, biotechnology. By the way, antibiotics, uh, uh, Alexander Fleming discovered this uh, uh, penicillin before, but nobody paid attention until American soldiers started dying of, of inflammation during the war, and everybody was in hysteria What? how to solve the problem. Then they, they realized there was already something. Uh, biotechnology, genetic engineering, uh, structure of DNA. I can go on and on, on monoclonal antibodies, contraceptive pill that changed the world, organ transplant, 
spare part surgery. And the bottom line of all this, that what we can say about uh, predicting the future is this. Uh, this is all what we can say. Okay, so your guess is as good as mine. As, and we cannot predict for even for three years what's going to happen. Uh, the other uh, issue that I, I want to uh, mention uh, very quickly is uh, network society. And uh, I think in this country, I don't need to uh, say much about uh, what happens in, in terms of, of uh, evolution or, or what seems to be a revolution uh, of, of number, in terms of numbers. Uh, and, and I'll just skip this slide, of course, uh, uh, you know, so much commercial activity around this. Uh, I want to uh, show you one thing, uh, which I'm going to get back to this. It's a very important, because if you look at this, you understand where the world is going. Uh, this is the internet users. Look what happened from 2007 in just seven years. Uh, where this part of the world, Asia, went from 37 to 46 relative to the rest of the world. Europe shrank from 27 to 19. North America from 20 to 10. And you would never predict that Africa will go to the same as North America. The number of internet users in Africa is equal to the number of users in North America. You'll never predict this. Certainly not seven years ago. If I would tell you that's going to happen, you'll say, I'm out of my mind. All right? Uh, and this is the, uh, the uh, international population growth. Again, you see that uh, Asia is growing rapidly. Uh, Africa is growing rapidly. North America is growing by 3.6%. Okay? That's basically the same and see what languages are spoken over the internet. Arabic increased by 5,000% over the internet. Who could predict it? Uh, and so uh, I, I don't have time to, to talk about this. Uh, I just want to mention the two uh, other things, personal liberty. Uh, and this is one of the most, Jefferson is one of my heroes. And what is written on the rotunda on Jefferson Memorial, it's engraved here all around, is this uh, uh, eternal statement. I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility, very strong statement, against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. I, I don't think anybody can state this in more, much, much more strongly. And there are uh, many people who linked the, uh, maybe I'll, I'll go back uh, to, to Jefferson again. Uh, liberty is the great parent of science and virtue. And the nation will be great in both, in proportion as it is free. If you have freedom, you have science and technology and art. If you don't have freedom, you don't have it, OK? And uh, look here at the Nobel Prizes. And I don't have to, uh, to add more, but you can see that the democracies of the world are producing Nobel Prizes, if this is a criterion. And just I, I, I couldn't help uh, you know, uh, bringing uh, the Israeli angle here. Uh, because I'm uh, president of the Israel Chemical Society, so we, we are very proud of this, and, and I, I'm very proud of these stamps that I managed to uh, design with, with the Israeli Philatelic Service. But this is in less than a, a decade. In one decade, we got uh, six prizes. Uh, the issue of human dignity is not something that is obvious. It has to be produced, and uh, some universities uh, think that this is not important. They need only to support science and technology because this brings money and this produces or, or supports the economy. But if they don't support this part of the universities, uh, they will not produce the needed uh, human dignity and personal uh, liberty that is needed. And all the science and technology will become useless. Okay, and I don't want to bring examples here in this country. Uh, the conclusions is 
uh, what I, I uh, uh, wrote already, humankind faces a bright future because of uh, knowledge explosion uh, and uh, uh, unpredictability of science. So we are going to solve uh, the problem that we have now with future technologies, not necessarily with what we know today. Uh, the problems, uh, and by the way, uh, I am a proponent of chemistry. I think that chemistry is everything uh, because everything in science is, is material and material molecules and change. Uh, but the problem uh, that we have is the social polarization. And I've uh, added uh, here uh, a couple of slides just to make this point. Uh, in the old world, uh, we had the bell shape distribution of wealth. There was a middle class, poor people, rich people. So it was a bell shape uh, kind of curve. Uh, and this is the income versus production uh, versus uh, uh, demand and time. Now, these days, when we have overproduction, the world produces much more than is needed. So everybody is fighting for export. Those countries who cannot export will not make it. In, under such circumstances, uh, there is now a double hump uh, curve here. There is a wealthy, educated, employed people and all these who are left behind. Uh, unemployed, tyranny affected, poor educated, etc. And this is not only a problem of polarized, it's also an issue of pol the polarization keep growing and the distance uh, keep growing. Uh, it's like John Joseph Stiglitz used to say, uh, like uh, paraphrasing uh, Abraham Lincoln, a uh, government of the 1%, by the 1%, for the 1%. Okay, pretty much describing what's going on in the United States. So make it even more uh, dramatic. I, <coughs> I, uh, I put it this way, uh, and I talk about the young generation. So it's uh, up to us if we live with such a polarization, and I put a, a double uh, yellow line like on the road that is not possible to pass. Okay, uh, And this is part of uh, our uh, responsibility as scientists to bring people from here over to this side. And with this, uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I, I have just a limited world. I, I, I want just to say uh, something that will link me to the next uh, half, the second half of my, my talk. Uh, we live in an artificial environment. We, get, we eat a genetically engineered food. Everything that we eat is genetically engineered. We wear synthetic and genetically modified fibers. We don't live in nature, in, in short. We travel main, main devices. Uh, and we live on products of human imagination and creativity, not specifically on nature. Now, since human imagination and creativity has no limit, uh, there's no limit uh, to the number of people who could uh, be on this planet. And I want to uh, jump uh, to uh, this story. Uh, Okay, uh, <clears throat> this is, uh, of course, uh, Google Earth. And uh, this, this is a, a very short summary of what I would like to publish. Uh, depends on how busy I am. But this is the book that I'm writing. And the title could be Light Onto the Nations. Uh, because I think uh, Taiwan or the democracy of Taiwan is a very interesting uh, human laboratory that should uh, serve as a pilot plant for many other countries around the world. Uh, simply because uh, uh, this intellectual society, and I'm talking on the average, uh, pretty much bell-shaped, not too polarized. Uh, science innovation, very important here. It's an extremely strong network society. Um, just uh, consumption of electricity per capita, I found this is highest in this country. Uh, personal liberty and human dignity to highest level, I could see, and I travel much. Uh, you have to believe me, I've seen many countries, and I think this is uh, probably the highest level I've seen. Uh, and I want to say something about uh, the, the size, the nominal size of a country. I publish uh, in, a, in a, there's a journal called Smart Science. It's published in, it's in, uh, published in this country. 
uh, and it's the, the name, you can look it up, the name of the uh, article is, is Effective Area. And I wanted to refer to the issue that uh, nominal area of a country is not very useful to consider when we talk about uh, economics, politics, etc. Uh, look at these giants uh, like uh, Kazakhstan, Algeria, Sudan, huge. They, 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 this is a nominal uh, surface area. And look at the dwarfs, uh, including Switzerland, Taiwan, Netherlands, Israel, Hong Kong, and Singapore. A uh, really very small country, but you see the other parameters like R&D expenditure or total export or uh, electric power consumption or, or, or GDP per capita or income per capita. Uh, we see that all these are extremely high, incomparable to what is presented or exhibited by the other uh, giants, so-called. Uh, in fact, huge area is more burden than uh, advantage because we don't need the area anymore to grow wheat or, or, or rice, etc. Uh, and, and the surface area of the land is not translated to wealth anymore. And uh, in fact, it's a burden because you need to build more roads and, and trains and highways and, 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 and uh, administration and army, etc. Uh, so it's, in my view, it's, it's even a burden, a big area. Uh, and I uh, proposed a, a, a effective area K, which is a simple uh, multiplication of nominal acreage, intellectual competence of the people who live in this specific area, uh, their social competence, I mean social awareness, social responsibility, which is also translated later to a lower level of corruption in the government or, or more uh, responsible government, etc and expense of influence, which means uh, the, uh, the, the amount of, of influence uh, people who live in this specific area have on the rest of the world. And uh, musicians and, and uh, artists and scientists and, and uh, business people, global business people, have huge influence over the rest of the world. So that, that is uh, important. Uh, I, I want to mention, for example, I, I had uh, uh, some time ago uh, uh, conversation of Yuan Tse Li, uh, the previous uh, president of Academia Sinica, and he proposed that we don't talk about brain drain, we should talk about brain recycling. So people go and come back and, and somehow uh, enriching their, their capacity in this way. Uh, okay, now Taiwan is blessed with the genetic culturally diverse uh, population. Uh, it's an uh, immigrant society, and every immigrant society is extremely motivated. If you look at California, if you look at the New York area of, of the, uh, I would say, previous millennium, uh, oh, sorry, previous century, uh, it's a Confucian Chinese heritage, and I'll come to this in a moment. Uh, uh, 400 years of basically occupation by, by uh, all kinds of uh, entities. A uh, strong influence of Japanese culture. I think uh, uh, Taiwan has taken the good uh, example of Taiwan, uh, of, of uh, Japan, the good uh, thing from uh, Japan. A strong influence of Western culture. And I just want to uh, tell you when my love story started with Taiwan. When I visited uh, and I saw the ultimate, uh, what I called a Taiwanese chutzpah, uh, just to let you know, chutzpah means uh, it's a Hebrew word, uh, but it means a uh, bad thing. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, rude uh, behavior, impudence, okay. Uh, but in business uh, circles, it's, it's uh, something, uh, taking risk and, and doing something uh, courageous, etc. Uh, and, and Barack Obama, in his early career, uh, he understood that, uh, what's the meaning of that uh, word. Uh, and, and I just show you a few pictures, for example, uh, Kavalan uh, distilleries of, of whiskey. When I saw a, a place in the middle of nowhere, compared to the other uh, uh, traditional conservative industry of whiskey, which is mainly in, the, in the Scotland and Ireland and maybe uh, Canada and, and Midwestern United States, and all of a sudden, uh, this, uh, uh, this is a chutzpah, you know, people from, from totally different parts of the world, they come in and they uh, collect all the gold medals. 
And that's five years of, or, or three years after production. They started selling whiskey in 2008. In 2012, already received gold medals. In 2013, gold medal. 2014, gold medal. Uh, this is the absolute chutzpah. Okay? And that started uh, in encouraging me to look at other things. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, the Jialon Bao in 101. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it's not, and I'm, I'm bringing things that are not high tech. They're not semiconductor industry. This is obvious. I mean, Taiwan in a certain segment took major role, uh, like 70, 80 percent of the world demand. But I'm talking about different things, and I'm talking about uh, entrepreneurial spirit, uh, uh, such as this. Uh, pineapple cake and, and the orchid uh, industry. I visited South Taiwan, I went to various places, and I, I saw the entrepreneurial spirit, uh, like ornamental fish, fluorescent fish in southern Taiwan. Uh, and the, the whole thing uh, started, uh, I started my, my, my search on, or tried to understand what's going on. And this is, uh, I, I'm trying to uh, first, uh, explain uh, what I think uh, is the origin, why uh, Confucian uh, Chinese expanse uh, is so much different from the Western. And I think it goes back to the prehistory, uh, to societies that grow either wheat or paddy rice. So this is mainly southern part of, of, uh, of China. Uh, I know that up in the north, they, they grow rice in a, a dry uh, area and also grow wheat. But I would like to talk about uh, these uh, two uh, cultures. Low yield, less nutritional, subsistence of small population, uh, rainfall uh, irrigation, low tech, easy labor. Uh, everything different here. It's high yield, more nutritional, um, dense population. But you need a lot of planning, construction, and maintenance of irrigation system. Not only one village. You have to coordinate the work of many villages. So it's very labor-intensive, seasonal work, and this to uh, really <coughs> uh, bring us to a situation where the monotheistic heritage, which is the Western culture versus the Confucian, uh, this is more individualist, it's ideological, intolerant. I mean, by definition, monotheistic means that one thing is right and everything else is wrong. Uh, passionate, aggressive, dogmatic. Marriage between two individuals. In this part of the world, the marriage is between two families. Uh, the negative incentive is guilt. People feel guilt feeling. Not here. Here we talk about shame, OK? And, and even committing suicide because of shame. Uh, for example, it comes to extreme uh, Japanese culture. But you see, it's more calm, more flexible, more socially responsible. Uh, and it reflects in many areas. For example, aesthetic values. If you look at the monotheistic uh, at Versailles garden, okay, symmetrical, highly ordered, homogeneous. Japanese garden, that was a cultural shock on me when I first visited the Japanese garden in, 18, uh, in uh, 1985. Uh, all of a sudden, I see something which is not symmetrical. And I was educated in a society where everything beautiful must be symmetrical. And here's something which is non-symmetrical. So I was confused to say, well, it's beautiful. So maybe I have a problem. But it's not only the symmetry. It's an, an aesthetic value. But maybe other things that I was educated to believe in are not correct. So it was a cultural uh, shock for me. Uh, here's highly symmetrical. You see the religious experience. The, the people are like, like ants, like dwarfs. Uh, again, homogeneous, uh, uh, symmetrical, imposing, gray, uh, uh, unicolor, very serious. And this happy, uh, uh, very easygoing type of, uh, of uh, religious uh, ritual. Everybody does whatever he wants. No, nobody tells you what to do. And uh, you feel much, much more uh, relaxed and, and, and not intimidated that something, happened, something bad is going to happen to you. Uh, and you see it's very close to the apartment buildings here. So it's part of the society. The business practice is very important. I spoke with many business people in this area. And uh, 
Uh, in the uh, monotheistic heritage, it's a sum zero game of losers and winners, which means that if I am a businessman and I want to win, I want to make some profit, you have to lose, or someone have, must lose because it's uh, sum zero. Okay. And here I, I, I see that everybody, all business people, not only business people, they talk in terms of win-win. They have to make sure that the other partner uh, gets, walks away from the, from the deal and he is satisfied and he's happy. And this is, uh, these cartoons probably reflect this. Uh, <clears throat> uh, even dining culture, you see, uh, in the Western, everyone has a territory. Okay, and nobody is supposed to penetrate his territory. Okay, there's a place made here. Don't walk in. That's my territory. Okay, and if something is left in my in my plate, it's going to the garbage. I'm not going to share it. It's mine. Okay, and this is different here. Okay, more societal, more uh, even uh, uh, soft power and hard power in war and aggression. Uh, and this goes to the time on Confucius. You see, uh, 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 Sun Tzu, the, the, the artist of war, uh, he said that if you go to war and start killing people, that means that you're weak, because this means that you are stupid not to solve the problem in a better way. So you have to go to the battlefield. That's the last resort. And if we even go to the um, movie industry, I put this in small font and big font, okay, as opposed to uh, Bruce Lee and Kung Fu, okay. Uh, this is what is amazing to me that this guy became the governor of <laughs> California, a country that has chain of University of California, Stanford, Caltech, Silicon Valley, and this governor. Okay, that's happened only in the United States. Uh, okay, uh, one more thing about the history, uh, uh, just to, to summarize, uh, every problem has more than one solution, every phenomenon has more than one cause, nothing is simple, and we can never see the entire picture. Uh, <clears throat> Now, the, uh, I'll, I'll go quickly. The European dogmatic ideologies is not only the, the fight between Eastern Church and Western Church, between Northern Protestant and, and Southern Catholic. It translated the doctrinal ideologies of thinking, translated to other non-religious ideologies. Communism, Marxism, Revisionism, Leninism, Stalinism, blah, 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 all these isms are the same story. One thing, nothing to do with religious. One thing is wrong, everything, uh, one thing is right, everything else is wrong. Not only everything else is wrong, everything else must die. Okay? And this is something that essentially destroyed Europe over so many years. Uh, now, <clears throat> this has also uh, produced a lot of sophisticated uh, high-tech terror by the way, the, the word terror, or, or the, the actual word is terror del morte, is a Catholic inversion. I mean, uh, the, the Muslim uh, borrowed this uh, later on. Uh, but it's, it's a, a high, highly sophisticated modes or technologies of terrors. And uh, much of that, unfortunately, was exported by Soviet regime to this part of the world and caused a lot of damage that even now uh, the world or this part of the world is recovering from this kind of ideology. Just to give you an example, UK, okay, these are the 22 countries that Britain did not invade, all right, including Marshall Island, Vatican, uh, a few more, okay. Uh, this is the aggressiveness of the uh, United Kingdom. Uh, this is the military expenditure by countries, almost half is by the United States and United Kingdom, but the United Kingdom ceased to be an empire uh, at the end of the 19th century. Military expenditures, okay? China is relatively small, and it's growing a little bit, but compared to the GDP, is not extremely high. Uh, and this is an interesting story. Uh, Zheng He discovered uh, much of the world, that time of the world, the, the world of that time, uh, and they didn't do anything. 
He just discovered, he picked up two giraffes, put them in cages, brought them over to the emperor in China, and that's it. No permanent evidence that everybody, anybody has visited. And, and not that his technology was not very good. This is the, the size of sheep of uh, Jean He compared to the one of Columbus. And Columbus was 80 years later. Okay, but the moment the Western uh, discovered a new place, immediately uh, uh, starting a colony, starting uh, uh, taking advantage of that place, etc. And we know this. Now, I want to, uh, before I go to the um, uh, conclusion of, of what I, I see uh, about uh, Taiwan, I want to uh, do some criticism. Okay, and it's a friendly criticism because uh, this is based on. Uh, thing that I see. I'm, I'm not a journalist. I'm not a, I'm not a political scientist. I have never taken any course in political science, any course in social science at all. And I'm the only thing I can do as a scientist is to observe and analyze what I see. That's all. And this is what I'm doing. I look at the flag of uh, Taiwan and I see that uh, 75 of that is red. And this is a uh, symbolizing the three principles of the people of Sun Yat-sen, which was taken basically from, from the Gettysburg address of Abraham Lincoln. And uh, <coughs> the, the red is nationalism, uh, the blue is democracy, and the white is the livelihood of the people. Uh, and you see the relative surface area that is taken by these uh, uh, colors. This is what, uh, you know, in air conditioning system, you set a temperature what you want to do something. You, have to, you want to have 22 degrees, but you set it, but this is not your, what you get. You, this, the observed temperature sometimes is different from the set temperatures. So my uh, Taiwanese flag is what I observe, and this is what I observe. Uh, and I was generous with nationalism. It should be even more narrow. I see very little uh, national solidarity in this country, and this is one of the problems that I see that should be corrected. A lot of democracy and most of the flag is livelihood of the people. Everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants to have more ice cream and maybe discount in the department store, and that's about it. Uh, and, and the reason is, is uh, uh, becoming a problem. The population uh, annual growth uh, fell down almost five-fold in the last 10 years or 15 years uh, to uh, uh, becoming zero. And the predictions are that population of Taiwan will not grow uh, in the, will, will keep growing for the next decade, but after that it will start uh, going down and, and of course aging of the population. So something should be done about this. Uh, too much of national solidarity is not good. We know from the history. Too less of that is not good either. Uh, I want to share with you uh, experience from two weeks ago. I visited uh, this place. Everybody knows this place. And uh, when I went inside, uh, of course, I saw this. Uh, uh, I, I checked, uh, by the way. I went to the uh, information booth, and I asked the person in charge, how many people visit this place every day? So she was looking at me. Uh, why are you asking this question? I said, well, I'm just interested. Nobody has asked this question before. So anyway, this is in holidays, and this is in regular days, like 10,000 people, uh, children, uh, schools, etc., and many tourists from China, mainland China. Now, I noticed there's something in, in the background. There are uh, paintings, and the paintings are <coughs> uh, of historical uh, it's exhibition of the history of the war between China and Japan. And they wanted to glorify uh, this part of the history. And this is one of the frames. <clears throat> when I was there with my, my son, I told him there's something funny in this, in this picture. I, I, went, I must find out what's going on here. But he, uh, very soon he was impatient and said, I, let's go to somewhere else. Uh, I'm not interested. And <clears throat> I took a photo. I went home. Uh, by the way, this is the uh, surrender ceremony of China theater, in China theater. It's in Nanking, the surrender ceremony of Japan to, uh, uh, to General He Yingqi, uh, that time uh, uh, chief of staff of the army of uh, Republic of China, of Chai Kan-shek. 
I found in the Google, uh, thanks to Dr. Google, I found the original picture. And you see the flags. It's very difficult to see uh, the identity of the flag. So let me get closer. And I call it uh, Back to the Future. You see, this is September 9, uh, 1945. And uh, India was in existence. The flag of India was in existence at that time. And neither the flag of Pakistan. Uh, Mexico is 1968. Uh, Greece, this is 1978. Yugoslavia. OK, uh, so this is really back to the future. But this is not uh, the most important thing. I look at this picture, uh, which is another frame from the same event. Uh, this is the surrender of the Chinese. I want you to remember this box here. I don't know what is it. It's like a loudspeaker, radio. I don't know what. But remember this box. Uh, so I looked at this. I said, OK, it's interesting. Again, uh, I want to see, with the help of Google, the original picture and see what I observed. Something has to be corrected. You see, the angle is different. And let's measure it. This is 30 degrees, and this is 20 degrees. OK. And this is outrageous, because this is the winner, and this is a loser. So this is fixed, no problem. Uh, this is uh, one thing. But this is not the only thing. Uh, by the way, this is uh, very many things do not happen at, at the right time. And most things do not happen at all. But the conscientious historian will, will rectify all these defects. Okay. And this is Herodotus. So he knew already something about history. Uh, uh, the, there's another issue here uh, between the winner and the loser. You see the winner is higher than the loser. So this was corrected also. What, what was uh, 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 even more pathetic, still now I don't know who is the Chinese guy. Because on the same page of uh, official uh, Taiwanese page, uh, on the same page it says it's a, uh, uh, Okamura. And it also says that later it's Kobayashi. So I don't know who is this. And General He Yingjin uh, is, is, uh, is the head of uh, staff of the, of the Chai Kang Shek uh, army. There is a reason why he's doing this so politely. And the reason is that uh, He uh, was a student of Okamura in the Imperial uh, Military College in Tokyo. And he used to call him sensei. And he used to visit him. And uh, years after, I, I just, you know, didn't make too, take too long to, to look for the correct things in, in the Google. Years after the war, when uh, Okamura retired and lived peacefully in a village in, in uh, Japan, uh, every year, General He visited him for his birthday, sensei. So that's a reason for that. Uh, oh, I, I just wanted to, uh, you'll see in a minute, I wanted to prepare you for the, for the next uh, slide because it's unbelievable, uh, the next slide. It's like it took from a Roman uh, history of some, some uh, uh, Hollywood uh, movie. Remember this box? Because this is the only thing that will connect the next uh, frame to reality. And this is, here's the box. OK? And you see, uh, all of the Japanese are now doing this. And the, the Jap Chinese guy is not taking it, even not taking it, uh, humiliating, and, and even minus five. <laughs> OK. So this is a National Museum of, of China. And this is not temporary. This is. And now look at, at the details. And I cannot go to my, but look, uh, uh, trying to attract your sympathy. There's an amputated uh, a soldier or officer here, so you become more sympathetic to these people. Everything is well done. Uh, the Taiwanese Ministry of Defense, who did the exhibition uh, in Chai Kan Shek Memorial, has a lot to learn to reach this level. This is professional. OK, and look, look at the columns and look at the flags and everything. Uh, 
Okay, again, as Samuel Butler said that God cannot alter the past. That is why he is obliged to connive at the existence of historian. I want to, uh, another issue that I wanted, uh, uh, of course, uh, you know the, the territorial, issue of territorial uh, um, claims of, of uh, uh, Taiwan. And I visited last year uh, uh, this uh, school in uh, Sinchu, and I gave a gift to the principal of that school, and she insisted that we take a photo uh, while in the background we have the map of the world. And if I look closer, you see that Republic of China, <laughs> what you see here is not Mongolia, this is Russian Mongolia. Mongolia is here. Okay, this is Russian Mongolia, which means that uh, Russian Mongolia and territories of, of other countries are all including in the territorial claims of the Republic of China. For me, uh, it's a bit of a problem. Uh, and uh, I, the problem is that we educate young children, and then uh, what would the teenager think of the world of adult uh, when he sees uh, things like that? Just to compare. This is the map of Europe, and this is what you see here. This is Sicily. If I borrow the same proportions from Taiwan versus territorial claims in, in the mainland China, uh, it is exactly the same as Sicily. I mean, the island of Sicily claims everything that you see in color on this map, including the major part of Russia. Okay, all this. Uh, so. Uh, and, and probably the last thing that I want to uh, say for my observation, this is very close to Academia Sinica. Uh, it's, uh, you, you recognize this. I, I did some jogging one morning and I saw some English uh, terms here. It's, it's right here and this Academia Sinica is here. And if I look closer, I see that uh, the four words are health, efficiency, responsibility, and cooperation. Uh, for me, it's a little bit uh, disturbing because this is an elementary school together with the preschool, uh, five years old, six years old, and we talk about uh, health, efficiency, responsibility, and cooperation. If you do that, uh, this is what you get, okay, in, in my view. Uh, if you want to produce a, a production line of iPhone 6, that's a way to go. And I, I just... Uh, did some comparison to make my point between a computer where you have hardware, the processing uh, uh, mechanism, which is input software and output, and then communication and in memory, uh, to the human brain, which are basically the same principle. Is uh, uh, input is curiosity, software and output is, is imagination and creativity. Now, if you don't cultivate this, Instead of doing curiosity, imagination, creativity, you look for efficiency and responsibility. Six years old, six years old, or five years old, responsibility. Not this, uh, then uh, the, the product will be machine, not, not people. But with this, yeah, I'd like, oh, this is one more thing which I already uh, presented the uh, last time I gave a talk here. Uh, I, I, this is maybe true for no, politicians, not only in this country, but also in, in the entire world. Uh, I, uh, I realize that with the business people, uh, uh, they consider 5% success as a great being lucky. If 5% out of 100% of whatever they do is successful, they're lucky. So 95% failure is okay. Uh, with politicians, I realize the success rate is 100%. The, no failure, not, not, uh, and I, I, I coined this, uh, this is one of the chapters in my book, uh, One Mistake, Game Over. Uh, and this is related to what I, I saw uh, last year, uh, first time I arrived in China, in, in Taiwan, I, I was very happy to see elementary science education on, on the main, it's 80%. Uh, circulation, the other two, I didn't even put the other, the 200 and 2000 because they're not much in use, but this is the main bill, this is everything, the, the thing that every, part, every person sees more than once uh, every day. And I realized that all kids in Taiwan are left-handed, you can see from here, 
And I realized, of course, uh, they're not different from the other children in the world, so it's obviously an uh, inverted figure. If you invert people, no problem, but if you invert the globe, you are in a deep trouble. And uh, so they, the graphic smeared a little bit the center of the globe in a sloppy way, but left the, the um, outside. And I'll, I'll, I'll make a, a long story short. I, I, went, I realized that there was a bill uh, issued in 1999, but they uh, replaced it. They shredded, they took it out of circulation. And I went to the central bank of Taiwan in downtown Taipei, and I asked to see this. They said they don't have it anymore, so I, I went and found it in the Gulag Street. There are some shops for old stamps and coins, etc. And I found it, and I have a few of these. And you can see that there are some changes in the globe. There are some corrections, and there is something that was here uh, which is no longer there. And what is, was there is uh, uh, probably this uh, triangle should be, go to the record, to the Guinness Book of Record, because 90 degrees here, 60 degrees here, 60 degrees here, this is 210. Uh, this is record number of triangle. So, but there's no mistake. Nobody admitted there's a mistake. They, they kept saying there's no mistakes. Uh, here is the 99. You can see the Korean Peninsula right here in Madagascar, uh, where the sun rises in Madagascar six hours before it arrives at North Korea. Uh, and this is now the corrected one. Now they took care of this. Everything is now blackened. There's nothing here reminiscent of planet Earth. It could be Pluto, Mars, watermelon, whatever sphere you want. If, if you want to say, take this, flip horizontal, go to Google Earth, and everything is fine. So Madagascar is right here, and Korean Peninsula is here. Uh, this is a, a letter that uh, uh, after I spoke with uh, uh, Professor Daisy Lan Huang, and, and uh, she uh, published an article or something uh, describing my, our conversation, and she was received a letter from uh, the people of in, the, in the central uh, bank of Taiwan. Uh, you can read it for yourself, but there's no, no mistake. No mistake, everything is fine. Okay, I want to, uh, to finish, uh, I'm not sure how much time I have, but uh, it's almost the end. Um, I want to, this is sort of, of um, I would say, uh, constructive and friendly uh, criticism that uh, my observation. I am, I'm sure that if I'll go around and stay a little bit longer, if the uh, government of, of, of Taiwan will not kick me out, out of here, uh, uh, I'll probably see a few more things. But uh, I want to say something uh, uh, very positive about this country. Uh, this remarkable transition could not happen uh, it's in, in, in other parts of the world without bloodshed. To go from uh, uh, the white terror all of a sudden to the top uh, quality uh, of democracy, and, and no democracy is perfect. I, 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 I can say a few things about our own politician in my country and, of course, the great politicians of the United States. Uh, democracy is not the best, uh, uh, is not great, is not uh, the optimal way, but to have a non-bloody transition, and I give credit uh, to uh, the son of uh, Chiang, uh, of <coughs> uh, Chiang Kai-shek's son, uh, it's comparable and even better than what Nelson Mandela has done in uh, South Africa and Adolfo Suarez in, in uh, uh, Spain. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, these two guys, uh, while Chiang uh, uh, Kuo did a, basically a revolution in this country, uh, Deng Xiaoping did not do something which is less, uh, uh, should be less admired. Uh, he, he changed the, the continent or the, the mainland China in such a dramatic way uh, that uh, I, I really admire what he managed to do, which gives me optimism uh, to think what his followers may do in the future. And interesting, these two people uh, were classmates in Moscow, uh, in a school, in a military academy in Moscow, and they even married, uh, both of them, uh, uh, Russian wives. 
and they probably had some interesting uh, ideas. But what was done here is, is really uh, admirable. Uh, and I want to refer to the observation of what's happening in this part of the world, because Ch uh, Taiwan is now in the center of uh, dramatic uh, changes that are going on uh, in the world, not only in Asia. This is the production of Goldman Sachs from 2003, and they predicted that equality between the, Russia, the Chinese and US economy will take place in 2040. Uh, three years later, the, the, the prediction already changed. They say, no, 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 2040. It's going to be in 2025. Economists, after the financial crisis, uh, they predicted 2018, they're going to be equality between the two markets. And guess what? It already happened last November. So now the Chinese uh, economy is stronger than that of the United States and keep growing. Okay. Uh, the prediction now for 2030 is that two thirds of the world economy is Asia. 34% is China, India is second, not the US. 19%, uh, United States will be only 15%, and Europe combined only 13%. So this is going to be uh, probably in our lifetime, of, 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 uh, hopefully of all of us. Uh, this is uh, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and you see that everybody in blue is on this bank, except United States, Japan, North Korea, and I think this is Colombia. Uh, again, a, a statement from Xi Jinping, and I want to uh, bring up this uh, map showing a color-coded uh, commercial uh, deficit versus surplus, in green and surplus. And I wanted to, uh, I told you already that the United States focuses on military and military and military and they have, uh, and have this kind of uh, carriers and, and, and the war machine, etc. And they invest a lot in the army. China plays another ball game. China is not playing much uh, the army, military, they play commerce. And I uh, wanted to demonstrate it with two pictures that they took from the internet. But after I took, and you see <coughs> that uh, uh, this, this picture, after looking at that, I realized that this picture alone shows the entire story. Why? Because this ship is loaded with containers up to the top possible. And yet, it floats over the water. Okay, the draft is very shallow. What does it mean? It means that all containers are empty. And that's the whole story. The ship is going full one direction, go back empty. Go full, come back empty. And now you have surplus. That's the whole story. And here you have deficit. Uh, <clears throat> so, okay. Uh, and this is reflected in what's happening now. These are the trends. The World Bank, all these organizations, World Trade Organization, are going down. Uh, Financial Center, New York, is pretty soon going to shift to Shanghai. And it's not going to take too long before uh, renminbi will replace the dollar. It's only a decision of the Chinese government if they want to do it and when they want to do it. But this is uh, uh, the BRICS and, and the Asian Infrastructure Bank is already stronger than the World Bank and the trends is, is increasing. I think I'll, I'll uh, uh, just mention the, the uh, you know, people are scared of, of China uh, uh, choosing the military option. Uh, this is not what you're going to see anytime soon in Tamsui River, okay? Uh, and, and the story of missiles, etc. Uh, simply not because of what they say, simply look at what they do. Uh, they, they tend to solve disputes by negotiation and agreement. They already solve extremely difficult territorial disputes with India, with Russia, with Vietnam. Hundreds of years of disputes, they solve it. They found a way. Uh, uh, the cost of forced military option is prohibitively high. You know, in the world, there are two sides. One side is the loser, 
And the other side is also a loser. It loses less, but both lose. And they cannot afford it because it will slow down the economy. And they cannot even think of this because if they'll slow down the economy that on the last 30 years, every seven years they double, 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 every seven years in the last 30 years, they cannot afford doubling it because it will be a far-reaching consequence in terms of economy and, pol and, and political. Uh, just imagine the uh, uh, Tiananmen Square, which is many years ago, and it was domestic. Uh, it was too expensive. This is something they will not uh, afford uh, to have. Uh, and, and China plays the economy, and the U.S. play the military. And they don't bother one another. You know, this play like airplanes and aircraft and, and, and all kind of carriers, and this do the uh, commerce, and there's no friction. Uh, and you can see it. The military expenditures are going down. In fact, they were much higher. This is part, part of the GDP, and, and it's. it's uh, 1.4, and I think, uh, yeah, it's about uh, the same uh, 1.6. And don't, uh, we, we have some chemists here, don't, uh, don't forget La Chatelier principle. If you do something, you put a pressure on the system, what you guessed is most often something exactly the opposite of what you wanted. <clears throat> okay, uh, this is probably my final slide, and I put here Foie uh, Chouet. Uh, <coughs> Uh, 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 because this is the science of change. Okay. By the way, this is why most many people hate chemistry because it's all about change and people hate change. Uh, okay, Taiwan is, is luckily uh, uh, located in the center of the globe. Now it's the center of the globe and I hope I convinced you that this is the case. Uh, Tai uh, Taiwan keeps changing, crystallizing the independent uh, identity. Uh, China keeps changing, everything changes and they become more liberal. The people in China became more urbanized. They're more wealthy. And people who, are, who have more money, they have time to think of, of, of themselves about the society. You cannot go back. It happened already in, in Russia. It happened in other parts of the world. When people become wealthy, they are more influential. They think, and they say what they, they, they uh, think. And the government is becoming less centralistic. The provinces are having much more power than before. Everything changes, even what we think of the future. And, and there are many topics or concepts that are outdated, like what is a state, the Westphalian, the Westphalian state, the definition of a state, you know, sovereignty of a state. It's very old. It's by the end of the 30 uh, years old uh, uh, of war in, in Europe. Area, I told you already, it's outdated concept. Commerce is outdated in, in, in the old fashioned way. Companies become global. University becomes global. Uh, the world is moving to a democracy per capita. Uh, we're going to have personalized medicine. We're going to have personalized education. So what's the meaning of, of a state under this condition is becoming a little bit vague. Uh, personal liberty and human dignity increase steeply uh, all around the world. And, and rigid ideologies and, and uh, detached uh, politicians uh, lose ground. This is something that uh, they should remember. Because if I find something uh, about a, a certain thing that I've, I've discovered in, in the museum or, or elsewhere, and it took me maybe three hours to find it, my son can do it in one hour. And my grandson, who is 12 years old, can do it in 15 minutes. So it's, uh, uh, the world is, is, is being changed rapidly. I just want to remind you what, what I've shown you before. Uh, oh, this is just uh, uh, almost the final, this is the final slide. Uh, uh, I wonder about symmetry. And you can see that in this part of the world, it's a five-fold symmetry here, here, here. Uh, this is eight-fold symmetry, 12-fold symmetry again here. Uh, eightfold. There's not much fourfold and sixfold symmetry in this part of the world. All these, these are from, from the Czech and Czech Memorial. All this uh, came from Latin America because you know the cross, the, the rectangular, uh, the, the uh, fourfold symmetry. Uh, Korea is eightfold. Okay, lucky number. Uh, 
Uh, the only six-fold item I found in that uh, memorial is, came from my own area, which is from King Hussein in Jordan. It's a six-fold uh, symmetry. But thinking of this, I'm trying to constantly think of, uh, of symbolic relation between uh, uh, Israel and, uh, and uh, Taiwan. Okay, this is 12-fold symmetry, but 12-fold is also six-fold, right? Okay, you see it's also six-fold. So this is sort of a, a, a combination, all right? Uh, <clears throat> so that's the end of my, my story, and that's my final slide, and thank you very much for your attention. Some questions? It's your time. Okay. So, any, any questions? Where, 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 where do you get this information? Google. Google. Yeah. It's all, all around. All of these are near. The what? Well? Many of these are near. It's all Google. I either I, I, I buy something, I, I, I watch something, and I go to Google. What, whatever that is not, the good thing is that, you see, at my age, memory is not that good. All right? so, but that's not a problem, because I, I don't need to remember everything. I go to Google. And Any, uh, so do you suggest that we should change the national flag? <laughs> <laughs> and it's probably... Uh, you think the, the colors, the distribution of the colors are, are, are not right, right? Well, I think, yeah. I think that some, a little bit more, you know, uh, um, national solidarity yeah. among the young generation right. uh, will keep more people in this country, will have less brain drain, will keep... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't see many uh, children go around, for example, to the country as, as yeah. you know, yeah. youth movements, etc. It, yeah. Something still has to be done. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, here. Yeah. Thank you very much for your uh, wonderful presentation and also uh, uh, historical and uh, philosophical views. Uh, I'd like to not challenge but uh, make an observation of your lecture. First, uh, your main theme is that there's an enormous burst of knowledge and also scientific discoveries. As a result, it seems to increase a lot of the resources and also the, the good things about the uh, future of the humankind. Uh, and the data you presented includes uh, many of the new inventions, electronics and so on. However, and also uh, GMO, so to speak. But on the other hand, Will these two categories actually uh, less representative of the remaining of the part, which is the hunger in uh, Africa, uh, the, uh, the inner development, okay, the social um, uh, unbalance or off balance? So how, how, do you, how do you accommodate this differential such that we can, we can feel uh, as less biased, so to speak. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, what, um, what you see, like the picture, you see people of, of a line of hungry uh, women and, and poor children, malnutrition, standing in line, begging for food. Okay. But obviously, it's, it's a spot of the leopard. Okay. You see something which is very disturbing. And, and you see what's happening in, in, in Syria, okay? And you see what's happening in northern Iraq, okay? Awful. But you have to look at the global average and see what's happening. And if you look there, you see that, for example, water, uh, the water, water safety increases rapidly. It's not what used to be like 30 years ago. And uh, if you look at other, other parameters, the food, this uh, uh, planet, Planet Earth produces more food than is needed. We have uh, overproduction of food. We have too much food. Uh, the problem that we have hunger is not because we don't have food. It's because uh, there's political issue 
we cannot reach these people. There's no way to reach the hungry people because of the political problem. Okay? And uh, this will be solved gradually. And you see already what's going on in, in Africa. And, and you see the changes. And, and you see that uh, families are shrinking in size. And you see that the average income is, is increasing. And you see what's going on in, in, in uh, mainland China. So you have to look at the global uh, situation of, of what's happening. Now, in terms of energy, it's true that uh, we don't, we're not going to live on fuel, on, on uh, fossil fuel forever. But look at the sun. Uh, the plants, or the sun, uh, uh, you, you may know this, this uh, statistics, that the energy or, or the, the sun energy that arrives at planet Earth during one hour is equal to the annual consumption of energy of the entire globe. Okay, one hour of sunlight. That's enough for one year. Uh, we, we, we don't know yet how to uh, use it, to do it. I, we, we don't have 100% efficiency like the plants do. Uh, and the plants do it, uh, they take only like 0.3% per will of the sunlight. Most of the sunlight is wasted, nobody's using it. So if we learn how to do it, and it, there are indications, I don't want to predict the future, but there are indications that we're going there. Eventually we learn how to do it. We learn from the plants how to do the trick, we'll do the same. We'll have uh, close to 100% efficiency in exploitation of sunlight. Then we don't need all this fuel. So sometime in the future, uh, uh, my grand-grandchildren will read about fossil fuel, about oil in the Google, or, or whatever will be there that time. Because nobody is going to use uh, uh, the, they will use it for the chemical industry to produce polymers, but not for uh, and not to burn it. So, so th this we have to look at the, at the global, at the entire picture, the ever in the, the entire picture, the the tendency, the trajectory is amazingly uh, uh, good, and and uh, all reasons to be optimist about this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question about the polarization of the rich and the versus poor, because it's a progressively uh, worsening uh, situation. So, what's your view, uh, scientists as us, or more specifically, technology inventors, can do? Uh. <coughs> Well, I, I say that it is uh, pretty much our responsibilities as scientists, people in this room, uh, to help. Because this is becoming now the main problem of the world, the polarization. And uh, uh, because uh, politicians not always know how to deal with this at all levels, in domestic and also inter, uh, uh, international uh, uh, like one country is poor, the other country is is, uh, is prosperous, uh, and and it it it's a, it's a very complex situation. But uh, I don't think uh, there's much hope in bringing uh, elderly people to to. Tr of course, we'd like to teach them, etc. But we have to approach the young generation because that's the hope. If we take uh, uh, people at the elementary school level and just give them access to knowledge, that's all. And, and they, they will pick up because people, uh, Einstein used to say that it's a great wonders of nature that people or, or uh, children who went through the entire formal education system still preserve some curiosity, okay? They, we kill curiosity we, we, very efficiently in, in formal education. But people who before the school at the age of six and seven, there's still a lot of a lot of curiosity and imagination before we kill it, okay? If we approach these uh, people early enough and transfer them to the um, educated part of the world, then, then uh, it will happen. And I think it will happen anyway. Uh, this because uh, uh, information becomes more accessible to everybody, uh, network society, it will come anyway. We can not uh, do much, we can be only catalyst. We can make it happen faster. But I think it will happen anyway. If you look at how many internet uh, subscribers in Africa, 
That's really amazing. That has consequences. I mean, the, the Russian Empire uh, collapsed because of that, because the population opened up to internet and, and global uh, affairs. So uh, I'm optimistic also in this. But we can be catalysts. Scientists can be catalysts in this. Which primary school did you visit? You say it's, it's uh, nearby. Oh, it's close to. Maybe you should t tell the principal about. I chew it. Huh? Chew it. The difference between us is that you go with your car, with driver, and I go yeah. with bicycle. Okay. In, yeah, yeah, yeah. in, my <laughs> <laughs> in Taiwan, in, in Taipei. Hmm. So you mentioned about the problem of food is political. Then wh 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 how, how do you think? Uh, how, how do we solve that problem? Uh, you, you, you think the scientists can influence politicians to solve the problem? So it's not to do with the shortage, right? It, it's already overproduced. Politicians, I mean, I'm talking about democratic, yeah. democratic uh, regimes, and, and uh, I, I'm not happy with, with our uh, democratic regime in, in Israel, and I, I, I'd be happy if they take a lesson from Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think you are much better off the fact that uh, political uh, um, Offices are taken by uh, quite often by university professors and, and people who can uh, really uh, who do have perspective about the uh, and not just populist uh, figures. Uh, I think uh, uh, the example of the United States is pathetic. I mean, people like uh, uh, like Sarah Palin or like uh, uh, Donald uh, Trump. Okay, uh, this kind of jokes could not happen in this country. Okay. Uh, but I don't think you can, you can uh, influence much, uh, only give them some advice. And, and the best advice I could give if I, if I would be in is, is not, to be, uh, uh, not to be detached from, from the people. Because if you do something and you think you are, everybody is applauding uh, uh, what you do uh, uh, just because the people around you tell you that this is okay, uh, this is incorrect. They should be more involved with the with the people and understand the, what's happening. And, and the capacity, what a 12 years old boy can do, uh, not just uh, ignoring such people. Um, I have this question because I look at one of your slides regarding about uh, the language usage for the internet. Particularly, I uh, was su surprising to see the Arabic language, the highest, right? The highest. Uh, it's not the highest used. The it's a gradient. It's the steepest gradient. Okay. It's it doesn't. It's not absolute terms that there are more Arabic uh, language users in the world. No, the Arabic language is the steepest rise, but it doesn't mean in, in that so many Arabic users. Okay. That that lead me to some something may, uh, postulation that I have is uh, is it sometime the internet uh, was uh, while well, internet was uh, was allowed the population of the information and knowledge, but sometimes was being misused. Actually, uh, some is a false knowledge that will lead to uh, some uh, extremists. Every technology like this, even a car, car kill people, okay? You can kill people with car. You can kill people with, with, with ammunition, etc. But uh, every, every, if you don't use it properly, you can, you can do the opposite uh, adverse effect, of course. And, and internet the same, okay? Uh, <clears throat> uh, but if you look at the, at the overall effect and you see uh, how much information uh, a young, person can access over the internet. Of course, they are trying to cheat you. They try to sell you stuff. They try to change your mind and recruit you for all kind of religious cults and pornography. Or God, God uh, forbid, what, what kind of thing. But overall, you get so much information and you get the ability, if you are interested, to reach the information. Uh, and that changed the world. That, that's, uh, that's exactly changed the world. But uh, I kind of wonder because it's because uh, nowadays, you know, inclu including me, we are 
it's kind of occupy our time more in internet that lead us to actually have less time to think about things and also to read. I, I, I think it's a lot happened to uh, young people as well as me. I'm not, so I kind of worry about the trend that actually uh, we are not actually think critically because of internet. Uh, it depends how you, you see there's a flood of information. There are, there are many things around you and you have to make choices. Uh, and, and for example, I don't watch TV. I, I'm just, uh, there's a wall between me and the TV. Okay, I, it's, it's a in, in technology that I'm not using. And, and you have to somehow to share time. I mean, you have only 24 hours a day, unfortunately. You have to sleep some time. But it's up to you what you do with your time. And you can waste it, and you can do something interesting and, and enjoy. So I think it's, a, uh, it's up to every person. It's up to education of people. And uh, what I, I'm encouraging, I see many people, many young people around the world, uh, obviously in Israel, because I'm responsible for chemistry teaching in the uh, state of Israel. And I see that people, uh, young people are sort of saturated with the nonsense. And after being saturated with the nonsense, they, they go to some areas of interest. And they do it extremely well, much faster than you can do and I can do. Okay? They work much faster. The processor is now Intel, whatever uh, number, but they do it much faster. I'm envy of them. I, I think it's pretty late now, so <laughs> uh, we should stop here. And please join me to thank uh, Uri again for the fascinating talk. Thank you. Thank you.